This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We are less than one week away from the opening matches of the 2022 FIFA World Cup. We're going to break down some of those with Dr. Ed Fang of the Power Rank. We'll have him on to talk about that and also take my first look at NFL week number 11 based on my numbers. Fun show coming up. Let's dive on in and get it all started. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. And as I mentioned, we're talking about NFL week number Number 11 later on today. If you want to find that, search for the timestamp in the show notes over on numberfire.com. But first, let's talk some World Cup. We got Ed Fang on here to break down what his numbers you can find that on Twitter at the Power Rank and the PowerRank.com. Ed will be with us as well tomorrow. To talk about college football, week number 12. But Ed, it is your time to shine. How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing really well. Decided to put on the U.S. kit because I figure I could save the Germany and the Brazil kit for for later in the <laughs> tournament. But pretty excited that the World Cup is going on. Would still rather have it in June, but I can't do anything about that. And uh, it's going to be fun. And U.S. plays what Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, they play Wales oh, at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. So it's actually in a manageable time slot, which is fun. We can have some games on during work. I can get behind that for sure. Yeah. For sure. I will definitely have that on. Try trying to save the mornings for doing actual work. Uh, but uh, you know, definitely have that game on. And uh there's yeah, it's it's gonna be awesome. Yeah, the first match is on Sunday, 11 a.m. Eastern. So a little appetizer before NFL starts on Sunday, which would be fun. I've enjoyed that this year with F1, having that on the mornings and Sundays. Go F1, then NASCAR, then NFL, or if there's like a London game or whatever, that's been nice. Yeah. So World Cup can slide into that Sunday morning slot, and I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah, I mean, okay, Sunday morning. Yeah, that's fine. I, I don't think I don't think a lot of our regular crowd is really going to be watching those Saturday and Sunday World Cup matches until it gets pretty late. But but see, like I'm doing NFL stuff on Sunday mornings. I need a distraction. So I actually I'm pro pre NFL sporting events. Like if mm -hmm. NASCAR was like, hey, Jim, we'll run these races at 10 a.m. for you during right. NFL season. I would sign up immediately. Yeah. No thought, no thought involved right away. I would do it. And then this past week, you get a bunch of Germans singing Country Road yeah. and an NFL game. How weird was that? Well, like they they like got to the West Virginia part. And I'm like, I'm curious, like because I, I spent some time in West Virginia, lived in uh, Clarksburg for a bit. I'm curious what Germans think West Virginia is like, because like right. I think it's very pretty. Like it, there's a lot of mountains. It's it's fun area. It was not fun on my car's transmission to drive around there. Right. Um, but like it's a very pretty area. But I'm very curious, like what what do Germans think West Virginia is like? Do they know what sheets is? I assume not. Um, but like what, what is sheets? So yeah. you're you're from around Philadelphia. You have right. Wawa. Sheets right. is like Western Pennsylvania, West Virginia. Right. It's like the Wawa of that area. And both are amazing. I, 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 I refuse to pick. Um, they're both amazing. Is this a newer thing? It might be. Uh, it was so I was in West Virginia in 2013, 2014, I think. Um, and it was there then. And it's like made to order sandwiches. Like it's it's real. So I'm a quick trip guy because I'm from the Midwest. I love Quick Trip, would die for Quick Trip. I would at least consider sacrificing myself for Sheets. That's kind of the level of devotion. So we need to get Sheets to Germany, I think, is a big takeaway here, to, to let them realize that West Virginia has more to offer than just this John Denver song. Yeah. I've, I've never heard of Sheets. I've spent a lot of time in Pittsburgh, so I'm guessing it's a more recent thing. Next time you go, Ed, you gotta treat sheets. yourself. All right. so get a five dollar sub go to town it's it's a good time for sure let's talk about world cup now we had your a brief rundown of what your your world soccer rankings look like last week on the wednesday show if people want to hear that discussion i put the timestamp in the episode description too so if you want to jump ahead to what ed's uh, rankings were you can find that there but now we have our first match as i said on sunday which means we're taking those numbers and trying to convert them into game level projections. But there's a lot of intricacies involved with that because you have draws as being part of the equation. So mm -hmm. what does the process look like converting your world soccer rankings into a game level projection? 
everything revolves around estimating a goal rate for each team in a game. I do that based on my uh, my world rankings, which has a component for both offense and defense for these international teams. It looks at a five year window, so it includes the last World Cup. World Cups games are matches are weighted four times as much as a friendly, so to try to capture that as well. That does not do any favors for Germany, who I think are a little bit low in those rankings. But once you have those rankings, you can estimate a goal rate, which is actually very similar to how I estimate points in football. Once you have the goal rate, you assume everything is random according to those rates, and you can simulate out these games however many times you want and look at the probability for win, probability for a draw, probability for a tie. You actually get a score when you do the simulation. And the score is actually important when I simulate out the entire tournament because you need goal difference to figure out who's going to advance out of the group stage, so on and so forth. So yeah, in a nutshell, that's basically what happens. You go from you go from world rankings, which take these results over the last five years and evaluate the teams on offense and defense. And then you estimate a goal rate. And uh, then you estimate what happens in the match. Now, when you run those numbers, are you seeing that these markets are pretty efficient for like the match level betting? And are you looking to bet those or for you, is it more so betting futures markets based on what your simulations are saying? I haven't actually run the game by game simulations, but I would, I think those are probably the most efficient markets in yeah. the world. I mean, if I remember Rob Pizzola before Euro last year said Pinnacle was taking like 50,000 on a game <laughs> the morning before a Euro match. So that should tell you all you need to right. know about how efficient that market is i would yeah. tend to stay away from that i think the outright is probably a little bit more value if you want to jump on a match uh bet like i would do it right after the previous game ends and see if the bookmakers maybe overreact on an opening line sure but i think it's really similar to the nfl you, this market is going to be very efficient by the, the morning before the match if you want to bet early great you know, knock yourself out if you want to, um, you know, if you want to bet totals, probably a little bit better. And, you know, there's there's a ton of like auxiliary bets uh, that you can get on FanDuel. I'm going to talk a little bit later today about some some bets to, to win the group and to advance because uh, I do think there's some value there. And um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's I, I think I would stay away from those outright markets uh, the day before the morning of matches. And um, I would actually, you know, try to use that as a source of truth moving forward in evaluating these teams. And I think that's the tough part, too, with these ones that are up now. They've been up for a long time. The matches, exactly. the opening yeah. matches, they've been Lots. ground into efficiency right. for a pretty long market now. So I think it makes sense to potentially shy away from those. But you said that you had some group bets you like yeah. based on what your numbers are saying. Which one stood out to you when you're looking at uh, what you could find there? This bet came out of just looking at the outright markets and seeing Argentina as the second favorite and thinking that they're horrendously overrated as the second favorite. Uh, my numbers actually since the history that I've been running them over, I don't know, 15 years, I've never thought Argentina was that good. There might have been a time in which they thought they were better, but they are ninth in my world rankings right now. And I think part of the hype over Argentina is that they won Copa America last year. They beat Brazil in the final. Messi finally got his uh, trophy on the international level. But that that hides the fact that like Brazil dominated that game. Argentina got one uh, counterattacking goal uh, by Angel Di Maria in that game, and Brazil dominated. And, you know, there's some other results. Oh, and, and Messi wasn't that good. Leo Messi's getting a little bit older. Can he still dominate Mexico and Poland? Yeah, probably. But I, I, I I'm not... You know, when that competition gets really tough, I'm I'm not sure he's the same player that he, I actually I know he's not the same player that he was eight years ago. Um, but yeah, I, I I just don't see it in the rest of this Argentina squad. Angel Di Maria, like I talked about, was the player that scored in that cup final. He's actually not playing a ton for Juventus right now. Uh during the season, he probably starts for them, but we'll see how that goes. And I feel like we know what Mexico and Poland are. They are good. Uh, they're also in Group B. Uh, Mexico is somewhere between the 15th and 25th best team in the world. Right now, my numbers have them a little bit behind the U.S. Oftentimes, they're a little bit ahead of the U.S. Solid football-playing nation. Um, 
Poland is just a really good, solid European team that also happens to have one of the uh, best goal scorers in the ro- world. Robert Lewandowski, uh, who plays for Barcelona now, is is also getting old, but is also bagging a ton of goals in in La Liga this year as well. So, like, I feel like I understand those two teams. Are they should they win the group? Either of those teams win that group? No. But I'm giving Poland about 19 and a half percent chance. I'm giving Mexico about 18 and a half percent chance. Both of them are plus uh, 490 to win the group on FanDuel. So I will uh, I will fade. That's my way of fading Argentina. And uh, yeah, I bet both of those. And they play each other in the first match. And it kind of really doesn't matter what happens, I guess, right? If you have both teams. Um, maybe Poland has a little bit more upside because Lewandowski is fantastic. Uh, but uh, yeah, that that's uh, that's the bet I like. At this now, point. You can also, um, I don't know if you'd want to do this, uh, but you can bet like the exact order. I'm just going to, you know, list off like different options you sure. have. If you, if you decide, okay, I agree with Ed, I want to fade Argentina. Now let's say you agree that Argentina is going to advance, but you're not total. Cause like you can bet them not to advance. Uh, they're, they're eight to one there. That might be a bit of a stretch, mm-hmm. but you could leverage the thoughts on Poland and Mexico and, potentially look into the exact order finishes you could go with sure. you know poland or mexico first argentina second and that way you're getting pretty decent odds and that kind of thing and i think that that is at least somewhat intriguing now i wish there were a market i don't see one right now at least at fanduel where you could bet um where it's either um mexico or poland to win uh yeah. versus that kind of thing you right. could bet uh group c runner-up to be argentina at plus 320 <laughs> I think that's one way to do it. But I think the, the overall takeaway yep. is that you've got a lot of options in these markets. And I would just kind of dive through, take an assumption, like Ed was talking about, Argentina's overrated, and then try to identify the best route for taking advantage of that. Ed found Poland and Mexico to, to win the group at plus 490. That way, that's one way. But there are a lot of other options too, as ways you can leverage an assumption into finding the best way to bet that. Absolutely. Any other ones you saw when you were looking at uh, the group bets for right now? Um, those are the ones I like the most. I'll yeah. continue to be looking at those. I think we're going to talk in coming weeks, and yeah. uh, I'll have more there. In terms of the group, uh, just one more insight, and I haven't turned this into a bet yet, but a lot of fans of the U.S. men's national team are talking about the Wales game as kind of the key. If you win the Wales game, you're pretty much through. And while I don't necessarily disagree with that, in, in the U.S., and Wales are, you know, I mean, they're the second best group. Neither of those teams are as good as England. But what I think people are missing is that Iran is not some pushover. This country has 80 million people, and they're 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 not a slouch. They're 32nd in my numbers, and that definitely makes them the worst group. Uh, so, for example, the U.S. is like 16th, and Wales is like 20th. Mm-hmm. So, Iran is the worst team in the group, but they are also like the second best worst team amongst the eight groups. So. They, they're not really a pushover, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see them maybe get a win at some point here. So I, I guess I would say, like, don't discount Iran. Like, that third match is is still matters, even if, you know, the U.S. is on four points and likely to go through. Um, not, not a pushover by any stretch. Uh, should be a competitive group. And, you know, I don't put it past England to play some absurd, ridiculous defensive style and managed to lose a match in this too. So it could be really interesting in, in group B and uh, yeah, just don't, don't discount Iran. Okay. So the U S opening match is on Monday at 2 PM Eastern. The Iran versus England match is Monday at 8 AM. So uh, we got games all day Monday. That is going to be a whole lot of fun. And, and Ed, you have your win probabilities up as well over yep. the power rank. Is that, is that going to be updating like nightly or how will that work? Oh, I mean, <laughs> you know, my plan is to have that up right now. So if you need to bet, uh, those those are those are that come from my model. The yeah. they're not perfect. I mean, they have Belgium as the second favorite, which I think we talked about. Yeah, um, is Belgium's been a great team, but they have a very old defensive line. And then I also figure out uh, Romelu Lukaku, the the striker that I've been talking about. He's actually hurt. That's why he isn't playing for Inter. He is on the squad, but not going to be fit until probably the knockout stage. So they're taking a little bit of a risk there. I mean, the man's fantastic. So they, I mean, they can't be the second favorite if, if they don't have him. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, Germany seems a little bit low. Germany's 12th in my numbers, which 
doesn't really make sense uh, to me. Germany is a great soccer playing nation. They have a ton of stars and they might actually have an advantage in. So this is a crazy world cup, right? Like the premier league, the Bundesliga, a lot of the top leagues played matches this past weekend. And they are now getting on a train and going to Qatar and, and getting ready for this world cup. That's not how this usually happens. Yeah. This usually happens after the end of the European club season. Uh, teams are have a camp for like almost a month. You play some friendlies and then you go to the World Cup. Yeah, that's not happening this year. And that actually may be an advantage to Germany just because so many of their regulars play for Bayern Munich. Uh, yeah, their two center backs play for Dortmund. There is a little bit of a sense that they the the guys that Germany's counting on play together regularly. Yeah, for their club team. Is that going to give them an advantage? I don't know. We'll see. They actually have a really tough group. They have Spain in that group. Uh, they start with Japan. Japan is no slouch. Um, they're somewhere in that that Mexico-U.S. range of, of goodness. Um, so, yeah, it should be interesting. Um, uh, that, uh, yeah, I, I think Germany could could do pretty well, although I like Spain yeah. as well. Yeah. Well, it'll be fun. Uh, again, match first match is on Sunday morning. That's going to be a delight. Check out uh, the Group C stuff uh, again over at FanDuel to see if you want to find some there with Argentina, with Poland and Mexico. But we'll see. And Ed, we're going to talk to you once again tomorrow for some college football. But I appreciate the time for today. I'm looking forward to talking more World Cup with you as the uh, as everything goes along. I'm looking forward to it as well. Thanks, Jim. All righty. That is Ed Fang. Check him out on Twitter at the Power Rank. I put a link to his uh, win probabilities in the show notes over on Number Fire as well. So if you want to find that, check those out. Go to Number Fire. Check out the show notes. You can click on that there where it says the Power Rank. We'll look at week number 11 in the NFL in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We, of course, are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, if you name it, you can find us there. And while you're there, if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. Now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now, new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's free bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Try out free uh, features like same game parlays, play your way and bet on more than just the final score wager on everything from touchdowns to yards to catches all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So sign up today for your No Sweat First Bet. Make every moment more this season with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only. Refund issued is non withdrawable free bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700. In Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com. In well, uh, Louisiana, 1-877-770-STOP. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. And in Tennessee, call the red line at 1-800-889-9789. Let's shift our focus now to the NFL and break down NFL week number 11 based on what my numbers are saying relative to the opening numbers over at FanDuel Sportsbook. As of right now, I've got two bets I'm locking in now. One I'm likely to lock in later on this week. The first one that I am taking is the Jets plus three and a half. That's minus 120 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. It is, uh, or uh, that is plus three and a half, minus 120. It is plus three at minus 105 elsewhere. I'd rather take the three and a half, and I do think FanDuel will get to get to three eventually. So I'm going to take the Jets plus three and a half right now. I know that means I am betting a skittish, deer-like young quarterback against Bill Belichick, which is very, very scary. But the Patriots' offense is also pretty scary, not in the good way. My traditional model, which does include a prior still, has the Patriots' offense ranked 29th in the league right now. And that's going up against the Jets' defense, which ranks 5th. Now... The same is true on the opposing side, where the, the Patriots offense is definitively better than the Jets offense, but the Jets grayed out as a better offense than the Patriots right now, weirdly. I know that might seem odd, but they faced a lot of tough matchups. They've been okay in some of them. They had a shot to win this game in the first meeting, and I know, you know, that's 
a bit odd because Zach Wilson tried to throw that game away, short circuited a couple times under pressure, and it is fully within the range of outcomes that could happen once again. And that's why we're getting three and a half right now on this match. But I think the Patriots are a little bit worse in perception. So even with this being at minus 120, I am going to take the plus three and a half on the Jets. I think that's the right way to go with this one. I do think it will get to three at FanDuel eventually, uh, but I'll take three and a half in the Jets at minus 120 with that still being available. The other spread I want right now is the Cardinals plus eight against the 49ers. This game is in Mexico City. So neutral site game, not getting a home field bump for the Cardinals. But my numbers have this game at five and a half in favor of San Francisco. So I'm getting six. I'm getting seven. I get a push on eight, which is some nice flexibility. The Cardinals might not have Kyler Murray, but we saw them play pretty well with Colt McCoy this past week. They played above expectation uh, against the Rams. McCoy played decent overall. So that's encouraging. And the Cardinals overall, since they got DeAndre Hopkins back, have been much better on late down. Their late down success rate early on this year was hideous. Like they were awful relative to expectation on late downs. They've been a lot better since they got DeAndre Hopkins back. Now, Zach Ertz is a contributor on third downs and not having him could hurt that. But it's not as impactful for me to lose Zach Ertz as it was to gain DeAndre Hopkins. The 49ers, they're a very volatile team in terms of how well their offense plays. They have awesome games from a passing efficiency perspective. They have like spike games, but they also have some duds. And last week against the Chargers, at least in early downs, was a dud. They did make up for it by playing well on third and fourth now, but kind of don't want to bank on that as much if you're trying to win predictably. Now, that volatility could push you towards the Arizona money line, Arizona money line versus the spread at plus eight. But there are a lot of outcomes, a lot of paths to a plus eight for Arizona here. So I'm, I'm going to take that. Uh, the plus eight is minus 110 at FanDuel. Even if Kyler does wind up sitting, I don't think that'll impact my views here too much. Just because we've seen Colt McCoy play well, both last year and this year, to the point where I think we can reliably expect them to be decent in this one. So I will take the Cardinals plus eight on the neutral site down in Mexico City. One number I'm not betting now, but I'm likely to add is the Falcons against the Bears. Uh, right now, that's the Falcons minus three. Uh, the Bears side, the plus three is minus 112. There's been a lot of positive buzz around Justin Fields right now, just justifiably so. He's looked great. He's been super, super fun to watch. He's made this offense better. But that buzz leads me to think there's a chance this game comes under a field goal. We get it uh, at two and a half eventually. And that would make a pretty big difference. So I'm going to keep an eye on the Bears plus three. I, I want the Falcon side here. I'm going to keep an eye on the Bears plus three. Right now it's minus 112. If it moves to minus 115 or so, then I'm going to wait. Because I think that that indicates that I'll be able to hold out and potentially get a two and a half at some point. On the opposing side, if it moves down to minus 110 or so, I'll probably just take the Falcons and be done with it under the assumption that we're not going to see any more movement towards the Bears. My guess is we'll see a, see a shift towards the Bears, but I want the Falcons. So what I would do is open a FanDuel Sportsbook right now. It's probably changed since I recorded this on Tuesday morning and check out what that Bears plus three number is. If it's minus 110 or shorter, I would just take the Falcons because that indicates that the movement is done towards the Bears. If it is... Minus 115 or so, that means it's probably going to get two and a half, and I'd rather hold off. So uh, I want the Falcons at some point. Not sure when that'll wind up happening, but keeping an eye on things right now to get a better read on that market, and we'll likely take the Falcons eventually. You just want to see where the market is going first. The other spot where my numbers are showing value, but I'm not betting right now, uh, is on the Falcon or the Titans plus three. That's minus one away at FanDuel. I'm holding up on this one because of injuries on the Titans defense, because Jeffrey Simmons specifically missed last week. He was a DNP on Monday's practice report. If I take Simmons out for the Titans, that's probably going to make it where the Titans are still undervalued, but not undervalued enough where I'd want to bet the spread. If we get the read that he'll play different story. Like if he practices on Tuesday, that happens, then maybe I could see myself going here. But right now, I've got this game as uh, Green Bay by 0.87. So that's enough for me to typically bet it. But with the concerns around the injuries and also the fact that my 2022 only model says the Packers should be favored by more. So disagreeing between the two models here. I'm okay missing out on this one. I don't see myself betting it. I need something to change to, to justify. But for right now, I'm okay missing out at the 
Titans do wind up covering. So for now, just two bets for me. Uh, that's the Jets at uh, plus three and a half at minus 120. The Cardinals at plus eight at minus one, 110. Keeping an eye on Bears Falcons, that spread, as I will likely have the Falcons eventually. Just want to see where it goes first. And then the one I'm unlikely to bet unless we get some good injury news is the Titans plus three against the Packers. So light card so far for the NFL. We'll talk once again Thursday to see if I do add more on that side. Um, but for right now, I'm okay standing pat with those two, with the th- third likely to come later on. Before we finish up for today, got a recap last week on the show. And we had Ed on earlier, talk some uh, World Cup and Ed's college football numbers. Did really well last week. He went 2 1 and 1, uh, got good movement on all four games, not just like a point. He got like two or three points on most, or one and a half on most of these. Uh, the push was on LSU minus three, that closed at minus six. They won that game by three, so uh, that wound up being a push, but three points of movement is pretty sweet, so a good call by Ed despite the push there. The loss was TCU-Texas. The total for that game was 64.5, closed at 66. That one finished with just 27, but again, point and a half of movement, so uh, missed on that one, but good movement. The two wins were Pitt minus 3.5 and and Washington plus 13.5. Obviously, the Pitt one kind of sad now given the tragedy UVA underwent on Sunday night, so... That one's tough. Uh, Close at five and a half, pit one by 30. So easy cover there for Ed. Washington closed at plus 12 and then won that game outright. So we've seen all year that Ed's numbers are getting good movement. The market consistently moves in his favor. And it was nice that this week the results followed suit to get him uh, to reward him for that good movement. So again, check out Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. We'll have him back on tomorrow talk some college football for week number 12 with a special guest on that one as well. JJ Zacharyson was on our Friday show. He had both of his yardage props in that one. He had Donovan Peoples Jones over 43 and a half receiving yards. He had almost a hundred. He had five deep targets in that game, led the team with nine targets. He was sick. Uh, other one was Saquon Barkley over 92 and a half rushing yards. He had 150 or so in that game. So Hit both pretty easily. Uh, nice hits there. JJ also had a DPJ touchdown bet. Uh, that one, I think, was plus 280. He didn't score. Neither did Zay Jones at 3-1. to one, But uh, the yardage props did hit. In situations to monitor, we talked about the Chiefs backfield. JJ said he wanted to bump up Isaiah Pacheco in what was likely to be a positive script for the Chiefs. Pacheco played more than half the snaps. He had 80 rushing yards. So no touchdowns, but the rushing department... Pacheco is great, so good call by J.J. there. Other two situations were the Bucks' backfield. Uh, Rashad White fully took over this week, split snaps in the first half before the Fournette injury. Other one was the Steelers passing game without Chase Claypool. They were actually able to run the ball pretty effectively for once. Doesn't happen very often, but it did here, so that one didn't pan out. But nice to hit both the artist props for J.J. Check out J.J. on Twitter at LateRoundQB, and check out his work over at LateRound.com. Ryan went three and three on Sunday and then had a really nice uh, Monday night hit a couple underdogs who won outright in the Cardinals and the Packers also had the chargers to cover plus seven uh, losses for Ryan, a Seattle plus three Vikings bills under 43 and a half and the bears minus three. Then last night, Ryan missed on the total, but hit on a healthy number of props. The touchdown props that, that Ryan mentioned last night were um, Brian Robinson plus two thirty, Dallas Goddard two to one and Jalen Hurts even money. They all hit. All three guys score a touchdown. So uh, nice job by Ryan on those. He also had Quez Watkins over 11 and a half receiving yards and Terry McLaurin over 49 and a half. Watkins had, I think, like 80 yards and a key fumble because, of course, uh, McLaurin went for like a buck 28. So easy over there. Easy overs on those. Misses were the total as mentioned. Devontae Smith, Smith over 52 and a half. Dallas Goddard over 45 and a half. And then Taylor Heineke, over 220 at plus 114, but the touchdowns combined with the other props made it a profitable night and a good read overall by Ryan. So check out Ryan on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. I had a profitable week, even though I picked poorly on some of the bets to include again. Uh, I missed on the Broncos and Seahawks money lines. Those were plus 124 and plus 130 respectively. Hit on the Lions at plus 128, their money line, and then had the Chargers plus seven against the 49ers. They lost by six to cover that one. So profitable week. The reason that I'm frustrated with that though, is because my model, my traditional model had value on six different spreads this week and all six won. The problem was I took two money lines where I wasn't showing value on the spread and both those wound up losing. So if I just taken the six spreads 
that my model showed value on, I would have been six and oh, didn't do that. As far as the money line goes, uh, there were nine different spots where my model showed value last week. Six of them won. Five of those were underdogs. I picked two of the losers and had the Eagles in a, a parlay as well last night. They showed value there. That one obviously did not win. So my numbers did well. I profited, but it kind of feels like a missed opportunity. You don't get a, a six and oh week very often. So to miss out on it, a bit frustrating, but I'm very encouraged with what my numbers have done recently. I feel pretty good heading into this week. It seems like, I don't know, I, I feel like it might have just been variance that things weren't going well earlier on this year, getting uh, good movement, seeing the results in both the money line and the spread, the, the spread model, feeling a bit better there. So could have been a better week, but kind of hard to get too upset about it when the numbers were good overall. So uh, feels like a bit of a missed chance. But still, I feel pretty good heading into week number 11. We'll see if those uh, bets pan out. Again, always scary to bet on the Cardinals, scary to bet on the Jets against the Patriots, but hopefully the numbers keep up the good momentum from this past couple of weeks. That is all that we have here for today on our World Cup preview and our first look at NFL week number 11. But as mentioned, Ed was back with us tomorrow to break down college football week number 12, NFL week 11 coming up Thursday and props coming up Friday. So to get all those as they are posted, make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. Big thank you once again to Dr. Ed Fang. Check him out on Twitter at the Power Rank. Check out his work at thepowerrank.com. Find his World Cup win probabilities there as well. I am on Twitter at Jim Sanes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. I want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across the next couple of days. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow afternoon to break down college football week number 12. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 